Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Um, it's really, uh, it's really an amazing honor to be here. Um, as you'll hear in just a few moments, this particular chapter of InterVarsity um, has made an incredible impact on my life. Um, it shaped me nearly a decade ago in ways that I'm still trying to unpack. Um, the people I met here became my friends and my role models. People like Lisa, my confidants, uh, my comrades. Um, one of them even became my wife, like Lisa said, and so that can happen too. But needless to say, this really feels like home. Um, down to the nitty gritty details of stands that I used to set up every week <laughs> and uh, fish that we still wear proudly is like, you know, um, hospitality gestures here for new, new folks. Um, if you hear nothing else that I have to say tonight, um, and I'm going to try to talk really fast, so maybe you won't hear anything else, but if you hear nothing else, um, please remember that you are part of a much larger um, story when you gather together on nights like this. Um, a story in which God has been building his church person by person, generation by generation for decades now, um, and slowly embedding it within this glorious academical village called UVA. Um, and the community of Christians here, the people that you're sitting next to, this is such a precious jewel of a thing. It's like Eden. You will not be able to come back. You can come back in my place. Maybe you'll come and talk and you'll observe it. But you guys are experiencing something so special. Um, it's a community that changed my life and it continues to do so. I'm a preacher by training. Um, and I, uh, <laughs> I'm used to doing some exegesis when I'm in front of people. I'm used to taking a, a passage of scripture and giving you some great interpretation of it. But I don't want to do that tonight. What I want to do is share some testimony, um, share my journey with you, and really share an element of that journey um, that even listening to the people come up and talk and give announcements just is, is so pertinent. I want to talk about the gospel um, and kind of put quotes around it as a term. I want to talk about how my understanding of the gospel uh, has changed over time. We hear it all the time, and you've heard it tonight all the time, but so often the things that we say the most are the things that are hardest to pin down, aren't they? And so I want to take a few moments and share with you my story and hope that it's um, helpful for you as you try to discern the way that God has worked in your own life. Um, the staff worker that was here when Jed and Lisa and I were students, Derek Mondu, he loved the movie Gladiator. <laughs> and uh, there's a scene at the very beginning of Gladiator where Marcus Aurelius, a.k.a. Dumbledore, is dying. <laughs> and he's on his bed and Russell Crowe, I mean, uh, Maximus is, uh, is standing right in front of him. And he says, he's, he, he's talking about the fragile dream that was Rome. And he says, come, let us whisper together, you and I. And I've heard Derek do that countless times in IV. But that's, that's what I want to do tonight. I want to talk about something precious, um, something that's not fragile, something that you've learned here is very robust. But to whisper about it if we have to, but to talk about this really essential, precious kernel of a thing around which we gather. So to that end, um, there are three phases in my story. Um, three different periods of time that I want to talk about, each with its distinctive um, understanding of the gospel. Um, and let me admit to you right now that there could be a phase four, and I just don't know it exists, and maybe you do. Maybe you're there. Congratulations. Um, but I'm hopeful that maybe you'll fit in somewhere in the way that God has been leading me over the last um, years. So those three phases I want to describe for you for taking notes, or if you want to prove to people that you were here later. The simple gospel, the grand gospel, and then the living gospel. Simple, grand, and living. So first is the simple gospel. I was raised by uh, Christian parents. I grew up in a Christian household. Um, I attended church every Sunday of my life. My immediate family were Christians. My extended family were Christians. I was surrounded by the church. and. Faith was just an integral part of who I was when I arrived here at UVA. Um, and not even just 
any Christian faith, but a particular brand of faith, because I was raised a Southern Baptist. Uh, my parents had been lifelong Methodists, and then just after I was born, they became Southern Baptists. Um, and so I like to joke that I have both of my bases covered. I've been baptized as an infant, and I've been baptized upon profession of faith. As best as I can tell, it was because of all this, it was because of the way I was raised, it was because of this context, um, that I grew up understanding the gospel as a very simple thing. It was a story about a man named Jesus who lived roughly 2,000 years ago, and it was essentially historical information. It was a narrative or a biography, and really not even a very good biography, because it wasn't really interested in all of this person's life. It was really just interested in the events surrounding his death. Uh, think John 3.16, the preeminence of John 3.16 in the evangelical church. That kind of encapsulates everything that I want to say about this simple gospel. At its heart, it's this narrative that Jesus sent, is sent into the world by his Father, that he dies for our sins, and that if we believe in him, we don't have to perish because God gives us this wonderful thing called eternal life or everlasting life. And so kind of mysteriously, this gospel of history and facts about Jesus' life ends with this call to believe and be saved. Um, how exactly does that work? What's the connection? How does Jesus' life translate into me needing to respond by believing in him? What does it even mean to believe in him? All of that's kind of on the other side of things. What's important is that it amounts to this spiritual conversion. Um, it's this tidy three-part narrative of life, death, and resurrection. And it ends with this appeal to trust in this person so that we can go to heaven when we die. Um, so this is a brief history uh, three years, we think, maybe, of Jesus' life, and then an even briefer, stranger call to repent and believe. And for all these reasons, the simple gospel becomes a very personal, individual thing, um, maybe even a private thing, maybe even something that's kind of uncomfortable to talk about with other people. For better or for worse, that's the gospel that I brought with me to Charlottesville back in 2007, which is really freaky. And maybe that's where you are. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you were um, raised in the church. Maybe John 3.16 is even kind of the controlling criteria for you when you think about your faith. Uh, because Christianity is at its root this message about spiritual redemption of people. That God has done something and we have to respond in this kind of bizarre way, but then we'll be saved. Um, in fact, maybe some of you because that's where you're from, and because of the rigor of this place, and because of the different people that you've met, even in this room, have even become a little, become a little embarrassed to use the word saved. Um, because it just sounds ignorant, doesn't it? To say saved. Um, I remember so vividly sitting in a lecture hall in Old Cabell my second year, and um, I was taking a class called Faulkner in the Bible awesome class. I don't know if they still have it or not. If they do have it, my recommendation to you. But I was talking about something, some Christian theme in the novel, and I said the word saved. And a person in the row in front of me who was sitting in the right, right in the, the front of the classroom stood up and scolded me in front of the other people and said, saved is not a biblical word. And I was stunned. Um, didn't occur to me until after I left the room, oh my gosh, saved is a very biblical word. I could show you 85 different times where saved, the, the same um, conjugation of the verb, is written in our New Testament. But there's a culture here that views spiritual conversion as, as something, um, something weak or something uh, too simple to even be true. Turns out I'd have similar experiences for a while at UVA because my simple gospel often felt really inadequate and sometimes even at odds with what I was learning in a place like this, a place like InterVarsity uh, and in my religious studies classes. I did see the simple gospel. I had other Baptist friends. Um, and when Brother Micah came to town, do you guys still have Brother Micah? No. Oh, man. So I get to share with you about Brother Brother Micah is this... Uh, kind of angry open-air preacher. 
who would make his rounds um, in Virginia colleges, and he would come and preach in the amphitheater um, and tell us how we were all fornicators and going to hell. <laughs> he had a simple gospel, um, and I didn't like what I saw when I listened to him. Um, and then I'd go and sit in a religious studies class. Like, I don't think Harry Gamble teaches here anymore. This is just constantly me dating myself, isn't it? <laughs> Harry Gamble used to teach on Paul's letters. And there'd be six people in the class who were just bitterly angry that he would deconstruct the history surrounding these things. Because, gosh, if the history gets tampered with, how can we be Christian anymore? How can Jesus be real? How can any of this make any sense? We're having these kind of Hollywood-esque crises of faith right in the room. Um, but the moral of the story is not that I abandoned the understanding of the gospel for something else. I'm not trying to say that this simple gospel is too small for you and you've got to get rid of it. I was just forced to figure out how it could be true when so many others around me saw the gospel as something so much larger and grander. What the simple gospel gets right, I think, is first the total primacy of Jesus and the absolutely essential conviction that he was real and that he is in fact who he claimed to be. And not only that, it teaches us that belief in Jesus brings about spiritual salvation, new birth. I was just reading the story of Nicodemus this morning with a gentleman interested in Christianity. And Jesus talks about new birth, that things of the flesh are born of the flesh, but things of the spirit are born by the spirit. There's no other name by which we're saved, which means that the gospel is directed towards the reconciliation of God and people in that tent revival setting, in that tent revival way. Come forward. Pray with me. Historical reality and conversion are the simple gospel elements. And to this day, they're indispensable foundations for how I understand my faith. Well, let's move on because something happened here in Charlottesville that forever transformed my understanding of the Christian faith. And I know that if you've been around here for any length of time, it's happening to you too. One of the university's missions is to deepen and broaden students' understanding of Christianity. To take the simple gospels of people like me and stretch them. Because the God who sends his only begotten son to save me as an individual, spiritually, is not just interested in my conversion so that I can go to heaven when I die. But he's, he's interested in the redemption of all things. He's interested in the restoration of the created order. He's interested in the reconciliation of the human race. Things that you have boldly proclaimed when you were making announcements. Before I got to UVA, Christianity was a story that demanded conversion so that I could escape hell when I died. But now, instead of verses like John 3.16, I was given other verses to guide my reading of Scripture. Verses like Micah 6.8. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God? Another really huge verse, one of the catalysts, I think, for this IV class that uh, Jed has spoken about. Um, Revelation 7.9. When John looks out at the end of the age, he sees a great multitude that no one could count from every tribe, nation, and people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. I've spent hours talking about the meaning of that verse. Suddenly, my faith was challenged to be global. I served as a worship leader for the chapter in my third and fourth years, and I was constantly being asked to lead songs in other languages because surely that's what heaven would look like. And by the way, heaven isn't some, just, uh, some other dimension somewhere in which we fly around like angels and play harps. No, it's a restored planet because God loves this world. And God wants to rescue it. And he loves our bodies. And he loves our environments. He wants to rescue it all. It's a package deal. And so not only was my faith becoming global, it was becoming cosmic. It pushed me out in the world to consider my convictions about the meaning of work, about poverty, about justice, about equality for all people. And at the same time, it pushed me inward to reflect more deeply about who I was personally. It questioned the very center of my identity about who I was as this white, middle-class American male um, and who my classmates were as people who hailed from very different situations and socioeconomic levels. In fact, maybe the biggest way that IV stretched me in my four years was its insistence, its rigorous, relentless insistence that race relations were a fundamental Christian issue. 
I hope some of you have experienced those same things, um, and I hazard a guess that you have. Now, I would love to say that I received this stretching experience joyfully and willingly, <laughs> and that I'd stand before you today a transformed person, an enlightened person, fully conformed to the values of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and perfectly at peace with the way that I was pushed and stretched and molded, and yet that is not true. Because when the simple gospel is confronted with a grand gospel, like the one I found here, the collision is messy. I chafed with so much of what I heard here, openly, publicly, um, ungracefully. Some friends invited me to teach on racial reconciliation. Um, people who trusted me and had worked hard to give me this platform to vocalize and to think about race and my talk was about being colorblind and our relationships with people of other races. I spat on their faces, essentially. I remember arguing constantly with my large group coordinator about singing songs in Spanish or Swahili because I didn't think acknowledging the way heaven might look someday was worth placing some obstacle to the engagement and understanding of my largely white, English-speaking American audience. It didn't make any sense to me didn't make any sense. There, wasn't, there was something so much holier at stake in worship that I didn't want to destroy. In short, I worried that there were significant dangers lurking in this grand gospel. I worried that InterVarsity wasn't interested in the real person and work of Jesus at all, or about my conversion and my salvation as an individual, because it seemed far more concerned with the principles that Jesus upheld and the social and political ethics that he espoused in his teaching, the sort of 30,000 foot narrative and reading of the New Testament. Do you see what I mean? I feared we were reading through the story of Jesus in order to find something more ambiguous, something more universal, um, and maybe for those reasons, something more palatable, something that we could sell a little, e little bit easier to our friends. And at times it felt very political. I would ask questions like this. Is the gospel a spiritual thing oriented towards the saving of souls or is it a social thing oriented towards justice and human flourishing? And all of you are smart and you know the answer to that question, which is neither. It has to, well, both. I forgot how I asked it. It's both things. <laughs> you know that we can't reduce the gospel to either side. But knowing that and being convinced of that are two very, very different things. UVA was full of people in my home church called liberals. I had friends who were praying for my soul because they just knew that coming here would cripple me spiritually. And that I was turning my back on a faith that was for them essentially a conservative thing. Something that had to be preserved as it was and handed down very carefully, generation by generation. And I graduated in 2011. I can't even imagine what life has been like since. But listen to me very carefully. Do not let politics distract you as you grow here in this beautiful place. Just yesterday morning, I was in a staff meeting and I'd received a request from someone from another church asking us to endorse a new memorial in Old Town. I'm right up the street from Old Town on King Street, for those of you who are familiar with it. And it's a memorial that's commemorating the lives of two black men who were lynched in the city. And to our knowledge, those were the only two lynchings that occurred in downtown Alexandria, and they're building a pillar to commemorate their lives. And it was decided in the conversation that followed that we couldn't be seen doing something that could be construed as political because it risked polarizing our congregation. And so we withheld the endorsement. Now lessons abound, right? And they hit me all at once. You know, even, even if the memorial is the right thing to do, how do I as a pastor of people lead carefully and strategically when wading into political waters? I had a seminary professor who told me, don't take away the American flag out of your sanctuary the first week you get the job. Wait a little while. How can I discern whether this is the right time or not? And more practically, how do I be a good employee? How do I submit myself to the leadership of my senior pastor while still taking personal responsibility, which might mean going to endorse this monument 
without my pastor hat on. The list could go on. But unfortunately, the moral of the story seems to be the very same kind of distraction that I was confronted with so many times in IV. Is the gospel a social political reality or not? And if it is, what side of the aisle does it fall on? You can get lost in that question. It's a maze. If you've asked it before, please listen to me. Don't quarantine all of the richness and the depth and the meaning behind the gospel that you're learning and soaking in an IV. Don't treat it as something different or opposed to your personal political stance or something completely foreign to this simple gospel that you were given back at home. Instead, push yourself to widen your aperture as much as you possibly can. Avoid being tied to your current affiliations so tied that you lose sight of the more uncomfortable places where God is pushing and stretching you, whether those feel liberal or conservative. The gospel is absolutely a political reality. Jesus' teaching, God's action in the world, all of it takes clear stances in the world, and it bends towards justice and human flourishing and racial reconciliation, but the gospel is far too grand, far, far too large to fit into the American political spectrum. So don't be distracted. Don't allow politics to interrupt what God is trying to teach you. Look for him and follow him where he leads. He will sort out the rest. You and I need a vision of the gospel that allows us to see the variety and the diversity of the kingdom of God, not because the kingdom values anything and everything. Believe me, I'm not making an assault on absolute truth. I'm not throwing out orthodoxy and heresy. I'm not saying there's no such thing as right or wrong. But I am saying, as difficult as it may be to understand, that no one single human political platform can fully encompass this beautiful thing that we've been trying to talk about. That's what InterVarsity is so well poised to show you. And it's such a rare golden opportunity in a day and age like 2019. The last piece of the puzzle is where I find myself today, and I've called it the living gospel. You can call it Steve if you like, it doesn't matter. And to get philosophical here for a moment, there's something kind of Hegelian about the progression here. Um, There's kind of a thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Uh, For those of you who are philosophy majors or who like Hegel, um, and hopefully, therefore, you're a philosophy major, you can probably guess where we're going. Uh, Personally, I found the living gospel in reading people like Bonhoeffer and Bart, in reading the Sermon on the Mount. I heard about it from those. But essentially, the living gospel is a gospel that holds fast to a real history of a real Jesus just like the simple gospel we talked about. But it doesn't stop there because it isn't content with some spiritual, intellectual conversion. It's not just an agreement with the facts, but it's a total submission to Jesus. It's complete obedience to him. And that obedience then leads out, if we're careful, to these vistas along our journey where we're challenged to press more fully into the big picture God's understanding of social issues like race and justice. You see what I mean? The living gospel links the simple and the grand by providing this bridge which is submission to Jesus in all things. That's the coupling that holds all of this together. That's the solution to this dilemma. And so the living gospel points out the poverty, I think, of both the simple and the grand. It points out that ironically, actually following after Jesus doesn't have to be a part of either of those two stories, does it? Because the simple gospel is about history and conversion. But conversion without discipleship, and I mean that in a strict sense, conversion without becoming a disciple, without becoming someone who learns from Jesus, that doesn't actually result in salvation. Because salvation is following Jesus. You don't get it by by an exchange of a conversion. But far too often, the simple gospel is reduced to this sinner's prayer. It's superficial. It's transactional. It's fragile. And it's going to lead many people to hell. But 
there are also problems with the grand gospel. Because on the other hand, if all Christianity really is, is about this really grand universal story of redemption and all of the ambiguities that that implies, then it really doesn't need Jesus either. If we're not careful, we can be tempted to peek behind the story and access the fruit of Christianity, all of its humanism, all of its morality, all of its goodness, all of its social initiatives, and just bypass Jesus altogether and not face him. So let me give you just one example to show you what I mean. There are elements of this living gospel that look at first like they should enjoy all of the world's admiration, like no good self-respecting human being would hate. So in other words, there are themes in Jesus' teaching that seem pretty universal to the human experience. Things like love, for instance. But if you read the Sermon on the Mount carefully, if you hold yourself to strict obedience to Jesus in all things, if he is allowed to be the center of the gospel, which is the whole point, then something as agreeable as love actually starts to look more and more alien. Because unlike the world around us, Jesus' main command isn't that we love ourselves, but that we love one another. And it's not that we love those who love us back, but it's that we love our enemies. And that's foolish. Love is fine. Loving enemies is self-deprecating. It's risky. You could get hurt loving an enemy. You could be killed loving an enemy. But submission to Jesus is more often than not that really strange alien ethic, isn't it? It starts off looking like something grand, but by actually considering how simple it is, by actually reading what Jesus said about the Christian life, it's revealed as this stumbling block that it's always been. We think we can put him in a box. We think that we can sell him to the world as something that everyone will love. And then you read the fine print and and it's awful. It doesn't make any sense. And so let me conclude with a few action items here. First, what do these three phases of the gospel and my story mean for you? The obvious uh, question is to consider where you might fall in that progression. What is Christianity about for you? Is it spiritual? Does it stand or fall with your conversion? Or is it more philosophical? Maybe less about these you know, the things that we should look over, like uh, the virgin birth and the crucifixion and the resurrection. Maybe it's about these other themes. Maybe racial reconciliation is a great thing to do. And you're here because these, these are people who care about that. I challenge you that if it's not about following Jesus, I mean, it's not about doing what he says and seeking after him, then it is not a Christian gospel. And there is nothing here. <coughs> What does all this mean for student leadership here in IV? Because I was supposed to give a talk to the leadership, and so this is my tiny little talk to the leadership uh, at IV. How does thinking this way change how we should shepherd an organization like InterVarsity at UVA? Well, I think it means two things. First, it means that we must celebrate what matters most. If following Jesus daily, if submitting to him And his ways is what it really means to be a disciple. Loving in that really strange, risky, counterintuitive sense. If that's what's most important, then we must see that and only that as the metric of our success. Numbers are numbers. I was in this chapter when there were 30 people meeting in Minor Hall. And I was there when we were 250 people meeting in Mari. Looking at people like Jed, who are way cooler than any of us, who God had brought in to grow this fellowship. He used to be way cooler than us. Maybe that's... <laughs> so we have to celebrate the right things. And we have to ignore these other metrics that push us to think about different things and value different things. Which leads to the second suggestion I would make. Not only should we celebrate what matters most but we should therefore organize everything we do around accomplishing that kind of life change. First in our lives, and then in the lives of our friends. If we think the way to real life is knowing this God-man who teaches us to love in this strange way, then everything we do here should be oriented in that direction. We know that it's not a simple history that can save them. It's not just about conversion. It's not just about a name on a card. 
We also know that philosophy cannot save them. Good ethics cannot save them. All the racial reconciliation initiatives we could possibly fathom cannot save this world. Jesus can save the world. And so we have to give people what they need. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this chance to be together. Thank you for the chance to talk about the most important thing. There's no thing at all. Um, who's you? Thank you for meeting us here by your spirit. Thank you for strengthening us for the week ahead. Lord, I pray that these words um, that I've uttered would be edited by you in people's minds. That people would take away what you need them to hear. And I thank you for the amazing work that you're doing at UVA. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.